what makes us incredible sellers makes us pretty shitty leaders. And that's yeah. the competitive edge. And it's the me, 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 and it's the win. And right. And it's that drive. And unfortunately, we're supposed to now make it all about other people. And that's, you know, that's hard for us. Conversations are at the heart of everything we do. But how do you turn a conversation into revenue? Welcome to B2B EQ, a podcast from Unifor. I'm your host, Tim Harris. Join me as I interview business leaders and market makers to learn how to move deals forward, scale best practices, and establish relationships that create value and grow revenue. Let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of B2B EQ. Today's guest is someone that I've had the pleasure of knowing for a while. I think we first met in Nashville, Tennessee. Yeah, it was. And uh, she loves to help others feel successful and definitely is one that is a coach and a mentor, which leads me to know why she started Girls Club, the sales bar, and is founder and president of Factor 8. Make sure to check them out. She's often caught cursing. She's billed <laughs> as one of the top coaches and top women in sales. And AISP, which is an organization near and dear to both of us, one of the most influential for the past 10 years there. So Lauren, it is so great to have you. And gosh, you have made quite a career for yourself in sales and working with organizations all over the country and all over the world. Thanks for being here. It's my pleasure, old friend. I got to get some of those numbers out of my profile so I don't sound so old. Ah, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's wisdom. It's wisdom. Right. Well, you know, on, we, your, on your way up, we're all like, oh yeah, 10 years in a row, I got that. And now once you kind of hit this age and this level, you're like, maybe a year or two sounds better. Ah, <laughs> uh, good accolades. Well, speaking of a lot that's changed over the last 10 years, I'm going to jump right in because before this, we were talking about selling over video how much we all communicate over video. It's been a long time since I've seen you face to face, but how tough it is. And one of the challenges I want to ask you about right off the bat is we did a report. We were asking buyers and sellers in North America. And we said, okay, what are some of the challenges you're facing? 58% of sellers said they were less confident when they were on video than they were face to face. To me, that's a yeah. big challenge. And, yeah, that, and doesn't, it, that doesn't surprise me, Tim. Sorry, I know I, I was like, yeah, 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 that interrupted yeah. me, but no, it doesn't surprise me a bit. I think that we're most confident face-to-face, -face, right? And let's not, then we've got phone, and I bet they're even less confident on the phone and less confident on, like the only place sellers today are confident is with their thumbs on text. <laughs> That's where they feel confident is when they're hiding behind the screen, not front and center on it. Which is crazy because in a face-to-face -face environment, you don't get the chance to really hide behind a screen, but it leads me to another point. I think it was in the 80 percentile range of sellers that use slides mm -hmm. in a meeting. So you've got a ton of slide sharing. And I know even when I'm on slides, it's like I'm staring at my own work. I'm looking at myself a little bit. It feels weird. Mm -hmm. And then I can't read the room or see anybody on the other side of it. So what are some some different tactics or what are some things sellers can do to really get over that kind of barrier on the video? Well, you're right, because the key is for them to feel confident, right? Goes right down to my entire mission about feeling successful, because when we feel confident and we feel successful, we keep coming back to that job, right? Yeah. We pour more into those channels than the channels where we feel like shit in our lives. It ain't rocket science, but there you go. True. And our, we're asking our reps to sell virtually from the comfort of their bedrooms. And that's tough on them. And Tim, you and I have come up and your listeners, right? We've been in this industry yeah. long enough that we used to compare virtual selling to face to face all the time, but that's not who we're battling anymore for these kids. No. It's, it's video or nothing. It's, I wish I could hide behind my screen, right? It's yeah. texting. I have to text my kids. They're like, why would I set up my voicemail? That they're just not confident there. So our goal is to build confidence. And for people who aren't even comfortable talking over the phone, it's doubly hard to build that confidence over video. So your question was, what are some tips yep. and what can we do to help them? Number one, 
quit sharing your damn screen so much. There you go. Right. <laughs> so we think we're supposed to walk people through the deck. But what video gives us, remember, gives us, not forces, <laughs> the opportunity it gives us is to make a human connection, yeah. not just share my slides, right? Like send them to the to a video, send them to a demo, send them to a reel, send them to a website if that's what you're going to do. We're not in advertising, we're in sales. And that is where the info has to stop and the human connection has to start. That was quite a rant. You want me to do I, I, that over, but shorter? <laughs> I liked it because my follow-up to that is this. How do you then, what are some tactics you can do? Like I'm sitting on a demo, Lauren, I've got to tell you this software. I've got managers and leaders that want me to go and show these certain slides or these certain yeah. things. How do yeah. you, how do you start to yeah. gauge your audience? First of all, I think as leaders, we definitely need to do a better job of teaching the demo. So okay. that was the most important class that we created since COVID, since we're all selling in our bedrooms and bathrooms was mm -hmm. let's like, and literally I call the class demos that don't suck. <laughs> and then line two is because most of them do. Yeah. So if it's like, remember the old Jeff Foxworthy, you know, you might be a redneck and right. So like, if you give the same demo over and over, your demo might suck. <laughs> right? If you're screen sharing 80% of the time, your yeah. demo might suck. If you're talking 70% of the time, your demo might suck. So let's break those down. Mm -hmm. The first thing we have to do is plan a better demo. And the way I like to tell people is don't think of it as a product tour. Think of it as a custom sample. Okay. I know your product's amazing and it does 18 things. Yep. What are the three that I am going to care about most? Get rid yep. of the rest. Absolutely get rid of the rest because leaders today, think about the information overload. We're not looking for more. We're looking for less. Yeah. I need it to be simple and solve my challenge. When you just took me to screen eight, my head exploded. Right? So pick your three things and plan your not demo of the entire product and the history of it and everything that it does, mm -hmm. but a custom overview and sample of these three things. Does that resonate with you? It, it resonates because I was talking to Brent Adamson and he was talking former gardener. They did a bunch of the research on like, how do I also involved in challenger sale, but how do I get a buyer to feel more confident about buying the solution? And I think that's the other thing that I'm hearing in this is like, okay, seller's not confident, shows up to the table, spits out a demo to just overload the it's buyer. Play. Exactly. It's play. Then the reaction from the buyer is, you just gave me so much. I don't know where to begin. Now I'm not confident. Right. And they both right. walk this away not complex. understanding. Yeah. I don't have the time of my day to figure this shit out. How am I ever going to implement it? And if I can't figure it out, how are my team going to figure it out? Uh -uh. So find out their top three challenges and show them the three things that solve the top three challenges. And then now to your point, mm -hmm. to increase engagement during that, right? Number one, the fact it's custom and you didn't just hit play, double. Yep. Now if yep. you want to double again, don't start in the demo, start in the conversation, confirm the top challenges, have a discussion, build some human rapport and connection, right? Yep. We got a cause yep. on that too. And then share part one, stop, share, discuss. Yep. Share part two, stop, share, discuss. So that 50% of your meeting doesn't have slides on it. You'll feel more confident over video when you are connecting over video and you ain't gonna connect when they're a teeny tiny square and all you see are your slides. Well, and I, I think you hit something too, just even in the way you're saying this and to our listeners that are seeing this maybe on YouTube or in a video channel, your body language speaks so much of the volumes of how you're keeping me engaged and, and vice versa, right? If I'm staring off over here and looking like this, even if I'm talking to you, it feels weird, right? And we all, <laughs> the iPhone prayer, I like that one. That yeah. was a good one. It's what people are doing. And, and I think we have to, it's almost a difference between TV acting and play acting. Because yeah. obviously we've all done that. And, you know, um, no, I wasn't an actress. 
uh, it, it is like on TV, you can be small because the camera's right. And in person, you could be small. Mm -hmm. But guess what? When you're selling over video versus in person, you got to be a little bigger. You got to yeah. take up the whole Look, I'm off the screen now. What? Look, I'm, I'm look, that way too. And so you've got to make your movements bigger if you're trying to be engaging. And you've got to lean in and you've got to show that interest, right? Yeah. Mirroring is a real thing, right? It's the psychological thing that builds affinity between people. And when Tim nods his head and I nod my head, guess what? He's seeing me mirror him. It yeah. works. And so it's it over the phone, by the way, you have to be even bigger because now I have no visual cues. But a lot comes through the tone of voice, right? I mean, when you think about that, because that's where I see a lot of misconceptions in like a transcript or in text message or Slack channels, yeah. like those are tough because of that, that you lose the tone. You do, you do. So I think we need to see video as a gift because yeah. it's allowing, listen, the OGs like me who grew up doing phone sales, the fact that now everybody does video, it's like my, my hands were untied from behind my back. Isn't this fantastic? And it makes me sad that the, you know, the generations today that are sort of starting on video, they're not given that good experience and they're, you know, they look bored. They're, they're not focused. They're not engaging. Uh, they're mm -hmm. not sure how to be, and we need to help them with that. And it's, it's, I think that the key to anything, if we're going to change a behavior, it's not just the instruction on what to do. And you know, I'm happy to sell that all day long, built a company or two on it. Yeah. It's the positive <laughs> feedback along the way. My training doesn't work unless the coaching is happening afterwards. And the key to that coaching, you're doing it well. Here's your positive feedback. That's what I love about your tool. Right now I'm getting instant feedback. What I'm doing is working or it's not working. So if you just throw people into the middle of the ocean and not let them know they're headed in the right direction or not, they're going to quit swimming. Yeah. It's not just about having more video meetings too, or just getting on video. It's about like, it's that effectiveness. It's that, I think you said it well, that, that enablement of the soft skills that, you know, past guests have said, no, the soft skills are the hard skills. I agree with that. I think we all can. Sure. But, but it's, it's, you're right. I mean, in the survey that some of the stuff that we heard with highly engaged buyers and we know that, okay, really interesting. You just map common sense, highly engaged, highly, the high sentiment, high engagement, probably going to buy probably yeah. Yeah. low sentiment, low engagement, probably not going to buy. Definitely not, some of the, definitely not going to buy. But some of the things they said were exactly what takes me back to your training stuff, which is they listened and talked and they listened more than they talked. They remembered something personal about me and some details, right? So they made some type of personal connection mm -hmm. and they focused on their unique needs and circumstances. Mm -hmm. And that came from the survey results, like straight out of a buyer's mouth. Which is, it couldn't be more important. And it's, let's be clear. Mm -hmm. You didn't bottle up rocket science there. No. It's like that is well, obvious sense. to us who have sales backgrounds. But um, uh, unfortunately, I think we've just over tooled and processed this to death. It, you know, 20 years ago, sales was an art. Yeah. And since in the last 20 minutes, sales has become a science. And you and I stand on this other side, uh, right? Out here going, mm -hmm. hey, look, can we bring some of this art back? Could yeah. we bring the human side back to selling? Because we have accelerated the hell out of some pretty mediocre messaging. Yeah. And and, and intent, right? And it, it's funny. I was just talking about this the other day on LinkedIn. I can't remember the last time I got a sales call. Now, True. every morning I get 300 <laughs> spam messages in yeah, all the spam channels. Can inspire. Uh huh. If it's written, I'm swimming in it. Oh and, God, yeah. But the last sales call I got, that's been a while. And a good one. I mean, I, I'll be honest. I oh, love yeah. a good sales call. Yeah. I like when I get on with somebody they're really engaging and fun to talk to. Like it's fun, even if I'm not going to buy the product. I almost enjoy it sometimes. <laughs> I do that's too. my that's my guilty pleasure. Like sometimes I, I even tell them like I can't help you with this, but I'm curious. Yeah. You, you perked my too. interest, and I, and I give them feedback. They don't like that. <laughs> no, true. But, but you're right about some of the channels 
in terms of like email and those things. And so when you're talking to, cause this is the trap that I see. Then you look at this as a manager or director and you have to hit your numbers and you're looking for a forecast and all those things. And where do they go? Cause it makes sense. How many emails did we send? How many calls did we make? How many meetings did we have? But what I can measure. I, it, right. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, um, this is something else I really, really like about what you guys do. It's been very, very hard to measure quality. And, right. And so even when you're looking, when you're looking at a forecast or Tim, if you're looking at a balanced scorecard, if you're looking at rep feedback, uh -huh. I can measure what you did, but I can't consistently measure how you did it. Right. And the, I, I really on. love that Unifor can help with that. You can look at those sentiments and engagements, and that is the end result of how you did it, isn't it? It, it, ideally, yes. You want to you want to be able to have both quantitative and qualitative, yeah, and yeah. and see if there's a way to to capture that in a way that's that's unbiased and fair or, or unbiased to a to a some extent because every manager is going to look at it differently. It, well, a hundred percent. And if you ask the rep, it, it's all a hundred percent. It's like asking a rep to build a forecast, right? I had one call and they were super nice, so I'm going to close that deal. So um, nobody's heard that before, right? Here's, here's a vision of the future I think would be really cool. Yeah. I remember way back when when we used to say, I wish we had the ability to measure not just calls or talk time, but conversations. And now uh -huh. everybody, right? Totally. And I wish there was a way we could measure. I remember then the next round was the, you know, 10 years later, I wish there was a way we could measure overall touches. Because uh -huh. not just calling, I'm connecting socially or texting or, oh, yep, check. Now we've got it. Here's the next wave. I wish there was a way that I could measure not just the number of conversations, but the number of engaged conversations. Mm -hmm. High engagement, high sentiment, right? Tim gotcha. talked to 100 people last week, but I'm not even counting the 20 that were sub 60% on both of those marks. Now the that's ones a tool. Right. The yeah. sales leaders are going to, whoo, that's an accurate forecast. And then what well, leads me to the next challenge. So I was reading a stat. It was like in the forecasting side of things, I almost feel like we're, and this is a bold statement, but I feel like we're looking at the wrong things and clawing for exactly what you just said. Like sales leaders are making a forecast based on all the analytical facts. Oh, it's got this many employees and oh, it's in this industry and I've done well in that industry. And I typically win there. Yeah. I typically win there. because we're people. stupid. It's because no. it's all we have. You think that's all you have? But then we all claw for what? We go in and it's, I remember the pipeline reports and the sales reports. It was like, AE, hey, why do you think that deal will close? Well, it's all we have. We can't, yeah. you know what I mean? So this is why I look forward to the yellow, green, red of right, the Unifor dashboard, the engagement. Yeah side of it. Is it working or not? And what's cool about that is, listen, I've been, I've been fighting tools budgets my whole mm -hmm. career. We, we have 13 tools for a rep, but like three hours of onboarding training. We, it, it's really, I True. issued this pie chart. It's like, here's what we spend per rep on technology. And that little pinpoint in the center is what we spend on actually teaching them the job, let alone how to use the technology to do the job well. So I'm, I'm, I've got worn out footprints on the soapbox of yeah. needing to focus on the humans. Um, but I, I happen to love your tool because it is the human side. Finally, a tool that's not just about accelerating the same old crap, but about improving the way we're doing it, right? And helping mm -hmm. sellers be better at the same time. Because that's, unfortunately, we just keep chucking BDRs into the front lines of sales like they're, they're the front lines of a, a war. And they yeah. are exiting rapidly. 70% of people who get into sales get the hell out of sales. They're not staying more than a year and a half and they're never coming back to sales. We're teaching young people to hate it because we're yeah. not teaching them how to sell. We're teaching them how to spam cannon people. We're teaching them how to... Right. We're teaching how to put someone in a sequence stuff. and pitch. And yeah, I would hate sales if I got into it today. I would hate it. I'd be like, so, just replace me with AI already. In my, my feeling is that sales in some levels, not in the enterprise, once there's a relationship, really working a deal and negotiating, but in the initial phase, what's moved over to sales is really marketing. 
Oh God, yeah, yeah. Right? I mean, it's just another way down the funnel. It is. Yeah. It's crept its way all the way yeah. down the funnel. But it's. But if we're not requiring our people to talk to people and we're not teaching them how to talk to people and giving them feedback on how to talk to people, then sales leaders, unfortunately, folks, we're marketing leaders. We're we're just these are you know yeah, individual you're... advertising units. <laughs> that makes yeah. That's IAUs. Uh, <laughs> there we go. We got a new role that's going to be popping out on LinkedIn soon, right? Fastest growing role on LinkedIn. But it's yeah, true. But you know what? If you said it had AI, people would buy it. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. Just farm it out. And <laughs> there we go. It it has turned into that. So I'm curious because you're working with a girls club. Yeah. Up and coming sellers that want to get into management and leadership. Yeah. How do you build their hearts and minds around the human side of selling. Because when you get out into the field or you get a boss that says, I just care about the metrics, that can be crushing. But let's be honest, that's part of the world. I think that it, both the factory eight side of the house and the girls club side of the house, mm -hmm. the sales managers that we attract and the sales leaders that we attract are the ones who are not just about automation, mm -hmm. right? They come to us because they want development for their people. And they know that sales managers who develop the people underneath them, sales leaders, because once you're a developmental manager, you're a leader, right? They know that the leaders who do that are more successful and mm -hmm. that the teams that they build are more successful and stay longer. So uh, we just keep practicing what we preach and, and that's right. Building their confidence and their abilities and teaching them to develop their teams. So, the girls club side of the house, um, these are folks who are in sales, trying to get into sales leadership. That's our mission, right? More women in sales management. And Tim, they take off like rockets. These are incredible human beings that just 70% of them get promoted before this cohort's even done. It's awesome. That's incredible. Really, really, it really is incredible. So, so much that we're trying to lower the barriers to entry. Instead of having one cohort a year, mm -hmm. we're actually launching girls club on demand. Oh, wow. September. 2023, you can get that dose of skills and confidence building and community at 2 a.m. if you need it. So we're excited about that. Um, it, on the factor eight side of the house, these sales leaders are working with us. And, and what's cool is that the very first class, even if nobody bought sales manager training, right? They bought BDR training, AE training, account manager, ISR, inbound, whatever it is. They said, we need to make our people better. The first thing we do is teach their managers. And the first class we teach them is called developing your team because that's the key to success. Helping leaders know that developing your people is job one, but even people who know that don't know how to, and that's what it's about. Here are the things you can do every day. Here's what to say and what not to say. If you have no budget, here's how you can develop your people. Here's the bare minimum of what you need to do with them. And then here's how you build a best practice a high performing team and a growth mindset. And and for those listening, what are some of those pillars of that program? Like what yeah. are some of the main big buckets you focus on? Yeah. One of the first ones is the words that come out of your mouth regarding training. Listen, there's never been a training emergency in the world. <laughs> there just hasn't been, which is great. I don't get 2 a.m. calls, right? Yep. Yep. But there are plenty of customer emergencies and product emergencies. So it's really easy to get called away to those things, which means mm -hmm. in nobody's world, is training the number one thing on their list. I run a training company and with my team, it's not the one number one thing on my list. We get that, right? We're vying for number five. We're happy when we get it. <laughs> that being said, the number one thing, the number one thing to determine whether or not a training engagement has been successful isn't who you buy or how they do it. It's what the manager says about it before mm -hmm. and after the training event. So that's where we start. You send your people into factor eight training and say, have a great day. See you later. Your other option is, hey, this is important stuff. At the end of the day, I want you to come back and show me what you learned. The other option is let's talk through what you learned and how and where we're going to apply it. Yeah. All the difference in the world, right? Absolutely. All the difference the world. It's just that simple. The other thing we're teaching people is about positive reinforcement. Sales is a confident sport. So when you come into a call coaching session and you're listing the 16 things that somebody did wrong, they're not walking out feeling confident. 
And your job is for them to walk out like a fucking superhero. I love that. Yes. That's it. Right. Yeah. And so we teach them, we reframe that and teach them how to have an, a, a call coaching interaction where people walk out just, I just try and stop me. I can't wait to call people. We got to teach them how to build that confidence in people, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. And then a lot of what we also do is then teach the tools. So again, there's this forgetting curve. If yep. I watch a video, listen, anybody with a video camera these days is a training expert. And Tim, it pisses me off. Yeah. Can I just be honest? That's not learning. Yeah. Right? That is entertainment. If you watched a video about a sales technique and you didn't get information about when to apply it and when not to, how to apply it and practice doing it, that wasn't edutainment. It, it, that wasn't education. It was edutainment. Yeah. It's like going to WebMD. Yeah. I, could, I totally had a chance to nail that and I didn't. I fucked it up. Sorry. So <laughs> it's like going to WebMD. Like I, you know, same thing I, or any of those, you only are going to take like 3% of what you read and then you're not going to know how to actually apply any of the stuff. So you might think you're, you know. And in three days, you've totally forgotten it, that you even watched it, right? So that's the other yeah. part that's up to our leaders and what we're teaching them is, you, right? We build the sales bar full of the tools where it makes it easy. Send them this clip three days later. Ask this question four days later. Have the call coaching session this many days later. Now all of a sudden I understand that it's important and it's coming through the manager. The key is you can't make the manager make it all up because they have the busiest job in the world. So we just stack them up full of tools and hit hit the easy button, right? Hit send, uh -huh. hit send, hit send. And everybody, right? Everybody, it's fast and it's easy to do the right thing. Which goes into that sales process piece because we've talked quite a bit about that. We're starting to roll some things out in our solution that's focused on sales process because part of the confidence side is having a known sales process, right? Sure. Having the known things that you need that buyer to experience or need that buyer to know to make a confident decision. Well, and listen, it's well documented that when you have a defined sales process and follow it, that the end result is better. That's for sure. But to your point, it builds confidence in a rep because I know where I am, yeah. and where I'm going and what I'm doing. And that's critical, isn't it? How often, you talk to sellers and, and sales organizations all the time, how often do you see a really defined sales process in a sales org? Listen, a lot of people have it, but they bought yeah. it, right? Uh -huh. and, and, and there's a difference between a sales process, a sales methodology and a qualification criteria. Yeah. And I think that we confuse those. So BANT and MEDIC are cool things if they work for you, but let's be clear, it's not a sales process. That's just, just a framework for qualifying and for, framework. yeah. Uh -huh. That's right. It doesn't tell me what I need to do at what stage. And then virtually, by the way, I like to see it broken down call by call, right? Call goals is what we're talking mm -hmm. about. Call one's goal is blank. Call two goal, call three goal. And that way I feel like I'm making progress mm -hmm. and I know that, hey, wait a minute, if I didn't get the goal for call three done, then this is where I am. I have to start here on the next one. So it's, I would say 20% of the time, I see a really, really strong process that links with the qualification, that links with the methodology. And here's the real kicker, links with the pipeline. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Links with where people want to enter, or where they're entering in the in the sales yeah. process. Yeah, all of our pipelines are filthy because as yeah. salespeople, we are not admins, right? Yeah, it, they yeah. just we're just not. And so, if we want it to be clean, our sales process has to line up exactly with the gates in the sales pipeline, mm -hmm. and the the training that has to go around that is what exactly equals the gate. When do I pass? When do I fail? what's required for me to get from gate one to gate two to gate three to gate four. And that's probably the biggest lift we make and we're, we're helping sales leaders with sales pipeline training. That's fascinating. It makes sense because if I have that set up and everything's clearly defined and we know exactly what's happening at those stages and I'm trained, which our research said that most sellers, yep, they know their product really well. So that's fine. Oh, we yeah. don't have that challenge. The crap out of that. Yeah. Yeah. So then it really comes down to, and this is what led me on this journey is like, I saw sales engagement tools being just spam cannons, attention grabbers. Yeah. yeah. But I saw even the best attention grabbers 
not necessarily moving things through to revenue and looking at it more from that side and saying, okay, well, what's the real problem? We're forecasting poorly. We're building things at the front. We're getting interest. Mm-hmm. And then it comes down to, okay, yeah, we checked off sales process. We checked off those things like mm-hmm. EQ, right? And, and that emotional it? intelligence side and like the soft skills side of, of selling. But you've gotten them to the conversation, yeah. right? And that's where we're failing. And so that being said, I guess, are you hearing that more in the market with sales leaders? Are they starting to double down on those things or are they still stuck in their ways, so to say? I wish. I think, frankly, that um, sales leaders are also crazy, crazy busy. Yeah, true. And we're all looking for a silver bullet. Uh And so tools are sexy and they're looking for the silver bullet. And this one promises I'm going to triple my engagement and the people at the top of the funnel which is fantastic, right? Yeah. Yay. Now AI is going to be the next thing, right? It all has it in there and it's going to get more people smarter into it, but it still comes down to, are you converting when it's human to human? Cause that's where we play in sales. I think all too often too, it's really easy for us as salespeople as leaders in our industry, where whatever our, our, whatever that industry is mm-hmm. to buy a tool for our former selves. Right. Um, Listen, yeah. I had the skills. If you could just get me eight meetings a day, I could double revenue. Let me get that for my team. But we don't realize that we're accelerating. Chris Beal always calls it accelerating suck. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's a great quote. I love Chris. He has some funny things he says all the time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny because his tool literally accelerates. Like he has an accelerating yeah. tool, but he gets that. It, like if you're just accelerating sucky conversations, you're certainly not, you're going to convert a little more, right? Cause you triple the amount and you're going to get more out of the bottom. Yeah. But what would happen if you actually really activated it at that conversation level? What would happen if all your reps got better? And listen, I've got 28 case studies I could send you to show you what does happen. Cause we're right. But what I've been missing, Tim, is the feedback tool along the way. Yeah, I know what good sounds like, and we do that in a call grading form, but it's still a human giving a human feedback, and it doesn't scare. Yeah, well, and and it has to yeah. Yeah. yeah, I I, just, I I am so excited for my team to be using this tool. Oh well, it's, I, I it's we're pumped. It's it's fun. I it's fun to be on this side of history. I think because to me, everyone I've talked to in in the last I think it's twenty five episodes, many I had never met before all like doubled down on the fact that EQ and those skills and that capability was after all of their years, either as sellers or sales coaches or leaders of teams, that was the one thing they wish they could bottle up. You so, can't, and you can't, and, and, and let, you've kind of figured out a way to it. Yeah. This is our time, yeah. isn't it? There's yeah. everything shifts like a pendulum. It, you know, uh-huh. when you've been around a minute, you see that. And for, right, we outsourced all of everything to India for a really, really long time. Whoop, now we started to bring some, and now we're right side. It always, right? And so I think that the trend in sales for the last 10 years has been acceleration and the written word. And I hope that you and I are at the front of bringing that back to remembering that it's about human connection. Yeah. It's kind of fun. It's like the nostalgic new game, right? It's as my parents tell me all the time, they go, oh yeah, that was cool back in our day. So what's cool is then it'll come again around. And I'm like, yeah. Uh Here we are. You know what what it means, Tim Harris? We're officially old. (laughs) This is it, man. I got to start talking about my aches and pains next. And then the price of milk and the price of gas. It's all fucking downhill from there. (laughs) That's true. If only we could just have conversations, get together over a cocktail or something, right? That's the easiest. That's the best way. That's uh, the best way. Oh, oh man, good. I like this. That's the next thing. But you want to make everybody feel confident? No, this is a bad idea. As soon as it's coming <laughs> out of my mouth, like we're all just going to video uh, and drink while we do it. There Drinking it is. Work. We, we will be hosting some virtual wine tasting soon. So I am excited about that. So if, if people listening, if they're sales leaders that want to get involved or want to have continued discussions of this, Lauren might be able to, I might be able to convince her to join me and, and many of our guests, but that, that's what it's all that. about. It's yeah. always fun. I would love that. So now you've said it and it's been recorded. And if my invite doesn't come. I know. Wine awesome. and revenue, they go well together, right? I think so. Possibly. So. And video confidence. This is something yes. we're going to have.
test. Wine revenue and video confidence. I love how, it. How cool if Q attends, right? And at the beginning of this virtual thing, it's all like mm, red face, gray face. And then two or three glasses in, everybody starts popping green. <laughs> there we go. We get the optimists in the group. Liquid this optimist. Is the, this is the study we need. All right. <laughs> There we go. There we go. I think that'd be a fun one. Well, Lauren, you let me learn so much from you. And I always want to turn it around and say, okay, let me learn a little bit about what got you here in your career. And so I'd love to hear some of the backstory. Because mm. <laughs> I, I know that's got to be fun. I've had a lot of good times. Yeah, I've had a lot of good times. So um, I started in inside sales management at Insight 20 okay. a lot years ago. And um, I, I got to tell you so much of that, my first year in inside sales management has still informed my career today. So um, awesome. yeah, I was just basically overemployed. I was 23 and I was the manager on my team. I was the youngest, wow. I was the only woman and I was in charge. I was from outside of the industry, right? I was from outside of the company. I was from outside of the state and I cried and drank not or, both, pretty much every night for a year. Oof. And I mean, it was just tough, right? Yeah. So, and, and I couldn't find the help I needed, Tim. That's sort of the origin story. So mm -hmm. when I, 20 years later, started to build digital selling skills, it was because my reps would come out of training knowing everything about the product, yeah. but nothing about how to get people on the phone, keep them on the phone, engage them on the phone. And here yeah. we are just talking the same thing about video right? True. It hasn't changed. It was just, that was, that was the tough part. And then as I went up into sales leadership, it was the same problem. We all promote our top reps, mm -hmm. but there's no, there's no university out there for how to be a great sales manager. So I built it and like it teaches people literally what to do and what to stop doing because it's hard when you're a super successful rep to then move into management and not know what the heck you're doing. So what do you wind up doing? what you used to do. You jump on yeah. calls and you talk to customers and right. There's a lot of sales leaders with VP titles today that are still doing that. So, it's because they had that charisma and that confidence, yeah. right? Like that was the natural, they were that natural person. What makes us incredible sellers makes us pretty shitty leaders. And that's yeah. the competitive edge and it's the me, 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 and it's the win and right. And it's that drive. And unfortunately we're supposed to now make it all about other people. And that's, you know, that's hard for us special snowflakes, superstars. <laughs> that makes sense. So, cause we, what do we do? We always say like the high performance athletes of the, of the team, right? It's the sales team. We all know that. Absolutely. Right? But we know that the best coaches in the world are the ones that build these growth mindsets and True. these learning cultures where it's about improving all of the time, right? Where the training and the learning isn't something we did. It's something we do. So yeah, anyway, yeah, my awareness. origin story and my superhero origin story is that I was overemployed. I was out way out over my skis. And then in my effort to figure it out as quickly as possible, I had to build a lot of what I needed and what my team needed. And that is right. Sure. It's been through like 18 evolutions over time, mm -hmm. but that's what's built the factor eight curriculum and our incredible success stories. And then girls club was a genesis of just being asked one too many times at conferences, why aren't there more women like you in, in sales leadership roles? How do we get more women on these stages? And I just got sick of talking about it and thought, I, I'm going to do something to fix this. That's so awesome. if you've got, yeah, if you've got awesome women sellers on your team, um, mm -hmm. chances are they want to be in management and they're too afraid to ask. So send them to me and we'll get them there and you will have a rock star, high performing sales manager who's going to hire more diverse teams, who's going to develop her teams more, who historically will have higher percent to quota and revenue. These women are incredible when you, once you take a chance on them. You just have to hit the button of encouragement. It's like a it's like a rocket ship launch button. And that's what we do. I love to hear that. And it's, and it's scientifically proven. Like I've done a lot of research on the EQ side, the empathy side, the, the yeah. factors that typically drive connection and motivate somebody to buy. Are, are characteristically found in women even more than men. I mean, we should stereotype all day long because it's true. And it's, yeah, I mean, yeah, I hate yeah. to say that, but that's, it's that's it's like, I'm not, it's just true. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, so it's very same things. However, yeah. like because we're wired differently, 
Yeah. When we get into sales, we excel, uh-huh. right? Most people will tell you, I've got two women on my team, but they're the top performers. Yep. Right. Now we're also wired differently. And that's what prevents us from getting into sales and from raising our hand to get into management. Uh-huh. It's, it's the prefrontal cortex. I know you really care about this shit. It's fascinating. I love that stuff. Like a man's brain is bigger than a woman's brain, but the prefrontal cortex is bigger in women mm-hmm. than men. And this is where this little part of it that lives of perfectionism, uh-huh. or the scientists will call it hypervigilance. Mm-hmm. We're wired to try to be perfect and it gets in our way all the time. It keeps us less confident because, well, I didn't do it perfect, so I'm not good. Yeah. And sure, I would be a better sales manager than this guy, but I've got more to learn here and I'm just not sure I'm gonna do it well. There's this confidence gap. And it was actually well documented, right? HP yeah. did the study, Forbes published it. If there's a job posting that has 10 things on it, a man will apply if he has, guess what the number is? I bet it's like two or three. <laughs> it feels that way. In this that study, I... it's six. 50, 60%, nailed it, they'll be happy to have me. <laughs> guess what the number is for women? If it's, I'd probably say almost like perfect. It has to be like that it nine is, or 10. Yeah, I won't apply for it unless I check every box. Wow. That is what we're doing to ourselves. And so Girls Club is not about man shame. And we have a ton of really great dudes who are involved yeah. in Girls Club. Uh, Joe Venuti, call out. I have to say, he gave you a shout out on the podcast. I got to give a hi to Joe. Yeah. He's, He's probably awesome. cooking in Arizona. Every year in Mentors, he sends women through yep. the program. Um, Joe. Yeah. I mean, men come in and sponsor. They send their women. They mentor. Anyway, it's the, the point is we're trying to quash the perfectionism. Yeah. And build up the risk taking those awesome. behaviors. And it works. It works. They've got the skills. I, I love to hear that. I have five right. nieces and I know that they can sell me on anything. So right? yes, I, 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 they're natural born sellers. Absolutely. I love and that. Cool when, so like that. school fundraiser time, you get a lot of calls. Oh, Girl Scout cookies. I don't even get calls. Lauren, you'll love this. I get video messages. Nice with one. a note underneath it that says, oh, Uncle Tim, I recorded a video. Can you then share it in your Slack and Teams channels at work? Oh, they're good. They're good. Yeah. And we're they're talking eight years old. Nice. So I have two little boys. And when it okay. comes to school fundraiser time, we call all the family. And yep. you know I make them make calls, right? Of course. And we practice the calls. Yep. Little you calls know, the beforehand. Oh, yeah. Their chore yeah. charts also have accelerators, right? Like I am a sales <laughs> and a training leader. This is a hundred percent true. I love but it. This is the important thing that we do is that we'll call one of the relatives ahead of time and be like, all right, Tim, it's your turn. You got to say no. Yeah. Because oh, they have to rejection learn handling. Part of sales. Yeah. Uh-huh. And how they handle the rejection. It's important to, to teach that because that's how you build the resilience and the confidence. Uh, if your kids are listening, they've found you out. <laughs> <laughs> My kids don't listen to me unless I text them. <laughs> Uh, but very fun. I love that. Well, Lauren, I could pick your brain all day, but I, I have to say this has been so much fun. I think the key, the thing that I come away with more than anything is just how you're building confidence in sellers. Some of the That's tactics key. you shared right there to rock it on video. Yeah. And I, I got to say, please look her up, um, share if you could where they can connect with you, give them all the, all the details. And if you heard about Girls Club and want to join, same thing, but please. Share oh, sure. That. I'm going to start with that because if you go to girlsclub.com at work, you're going to be in trouble. Do not go to that website. That's very <laughs> different than what we do. You, we're at wearegirlsclub.com. Wearegirlsclub.com. I know I need to fix it, but you know what? I'm doing it in my spare time. <laughs> and then find the content that helps build confidence for sellers who actually talk to people at factor8.com. F-A-C-T-O-R, the number eight.com. Awesome. Find her on LinkedIn as well. She's got some witty, awesome posts. You might hear her curse a little bit. That's half the fun. It builds confidence, <laughs> right? It builds trust. We hear this. We know these facts. There are and studies. There, there are, are studies. studies. There are studies. So cursing is okay. And if you want the report that we referenced, um, go to unifor.com, take a, take a look. We'll also be sharing it out on social and in the show notes below. To everyone who listened today for B2B EQ, thank you so much for joining us on another episode. <laughs> and we'll talk to you soon. Lauren, thank you again. My pleasure. We hope you enjoyed this episode of B2B EQ. Be sure to rate, subscribe, and follow the podcast 
for more exciting insights. To learn more about the value of EQ and the technology powering today's conversations, visit us at unifor.com.